Welcome! Oh no, my camera is gone. What happened to... Oh, oh no, there, there it is, back again. Hello, welcome to another Café Rollet, slightly later than usual because uh, we are kind to the poor people who lived on the Pacific coast of the US so they don't have to wake up too early. Sometimes we have some who like to wake up early, but slightly not today. Uh, who is joining us today from the Pacific coast? Could you briefly introduce yourself? Good morning. I'm Christoph Sapinski. I'm the designer of the sci-fi tabletop RPG Free Spacer. Uh, which was nominated for Best Rules of the Indie Groundbreakers. Wow. Oh, I'm so proud. Congratulations. <laughs> so you, you will need to tell us a bit more about that in a, in a moment. Uh, we've got two ice-breaking questions. Uh, the Cafe Release is a spin-off to our main show. Uh, it's, it's a result of the ongoing multiple lockdowns we've been facing across the world. Uh, so my question, mm. my first ice-breaking question is, what does your routine look like at the moment? Was it impacted in any way with uh, waving my arms at the world's current events? Uh, well, I mean, it has been. My uh, wife, who's in the video game industry, is working from home. So the office I'm currently in uh, gets taken by her in the day, during the day. And I have built a setup using my uh my laptop out in the uh in the living room using the television as my computer monitor so that's a little bit of a different setup we're crawling over each other vancouver is famous for tiny expensive condos and little apartments so we're in one of those so you yourself you work full-time uh in the game design industry or you you have a side gig or main i gig? would say i work full-time in the game design community. <laughs> I work pretty much on like Free Spacer and these sorts of things, trying to build this stuff I've always wanted to build. I was a video game designer before this and worked on a lot of other people's stuff. Never really got to work on my own things. So that's what I'm doing right now. I did Free Spacer and I'm currently working on a new project. Cool. Yeah, my my brother is also in the video game industry, and uh, it's it's the same. But he doesn't have his own projects uh, yet, uh, besides working on my website uh, for this show, which is a nightmare for him because I'm a, a terrible uh, person to commission work. Have you picked up any new hobby or interest lately? Uh, well, it kicked my bread baking up into mass ah. form. I I always I was. I started baking bread, like I guess I was an early adopter. I started in like early 2019, started making bread because my mom always made bread. And my wife did it, but she didn't really like doing it that much. So I just like, okay, I'll do it. So I started making it and then this hit and now I make it every week or every other week. So <laughs> it's nice to have some nice whole grain bread to make sandwiches with, you know. Yeah, my wife, for we, we had kind of different phases of the lockdown. At first, we purchased bread at the, the supermarket, uh, home delivered. Then my wife started baking every day, every week, every three days or so. And then, then we found a local baker and then we got tired of the local baker and we found another baker who sells, which much nicer, but much pricier. But uh, the good thing is that he sells their or they sells. Uh, they sell the um, bundles of unsold bread, so it's slightly more dry, but it's better bread, and it's uh, at a cut price. But uh, mm. moving on from this, yeah, the bakeries out there are really nice compared to the bakeries in Canada. <laughs> we started getting some nicer ones in Vancouver lately, but we went for years with having really kind of sad bakeries in most places. Yeah, you can find very nice bakers in London, but they are very pricey. Uh, it's like a lot of yeah, things. It's are, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there, there are options again. But uh, what about bread in space? What happens to bread in space? Where does a someone in free space or RPG must go to get their bread? Do they have replicators or is it uh, uh, very scarce to, to find bread or not? It like firefly and uh, salt and uh, yeast are very very precious. I I would say some of that would be due to your particular setting, but 
for technology, the um, the main way you would do any sort of cooking or baking would be using uh, biotech. Biotech is one of the big elements of free spacer. It gets a little bit forgotten, but it is a huge element. But as a, as a free spacer themselves, you're kind of outside the world. It's got a little bit of the adventurer outsider element to it. It's a little role I call above and beyond. You're like outside of any society and kind of looped into this contract system, kind of like a contractor in space. I mean, you get a home and all that sort of things in your spaceship, but which is good. Most contractors in our world don't do that sort of thing, but you're kind of stuck in that whole thing. You can't go do other things very easily. And there's a whole retirement project system that kind of follows you along that all about kind of building that. So like uh, connections to the outside world to get out of being a free spacer is part of being a free spacer. So what's your elevator pitch when you remove the bread part uh, for, for free spacers RPG? <laughs> because science fiction in tabletop RPG, it's kind of a crowded space, I guess. Is it more crowded than fantasy? I'm not sure, but it's quite crowded still. Mm. Sorry? Oh, it's quite what? Uh, it's quite crowded. There's a lot of science fiction tabletop role-playing games. So uh, oh. what's your unique selling point? What's, uh, what's the appeal of uh, Free Spacer? Well, when I started creating Free Spacer, it wasn't particularly crowded at all. Um, it was, there was Traveler, and that's about it. There was a couple other things that were like side fantasy was coming out. I think when I started writing it, it was right before uh, the new Star Wars games were coming out. So that was about, it was a year before that started coming out. So it was quite a shock when I tried their system and realized that their dice system was like a fancy dice version of what I was doing a little bit with the opposed dice. So I was a bit surprised. And then other games like Scum and Villainy and stuff came out shortly before I launched my Kickstarter. Uh, don't take too long to make your game. You'll see everybody else started to get it on and pass you, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, the, uh, the main thing that makes Free Spacer different, distinct, is it is kind of in that middle line that I like to call focus games. Um, along with like Feng Shui, and Red Market, all these games that are not about simulating a greater world, but about focusing on a specific type of gameplay, a specific type of game, a specific type of like uh, play. And this, the game is entirely centered around being the crew, of a, a small crew of a ship. You can't really do other things very much, but you can do anything involving that. You can be bounty hunters, you can be mercenaries, you can be technicians, which are like technical expertise, shadow runners in space kind of stuff. Like you could do all that stuff. And there's tons, there's a bunch of rules that are centered around a center core thing to do that, but you can't go off and become president of planet a or any of that sort of stuff there's no stats for your physical abilities because they don't matter to science fiction it's all about using tools and doing science projects and all that sort of stuff so that is where the focus of the game is which is one of the reasons i started using the term focus games i used the word indie game for a long time and then everybody's like anything with a small amount of people working on it. it's an indie game and i'm like okay well that's a broad palette so what's a different term well it's kind of doing this because it's not a story game but it's not a trad game because it's not doesn't have like strength and dexterity and all that sort of stuff so what it's kind of doing this and so i kind of try to figure out what that was yeah game classification is very frustrating i find we had a, a whole lot of it discussion is. about that with lloyd gian in one of our episodes because and people argue that pretty much no, as, as soon as your game was not by a company with shareholders, 
you were an independent game. I was like, well, that's, you've got, that means Wizards of the Coast and uh, Fantasy Flight games, maybe. And that's it. Everything else is indie. And I was like, I don't agree with that. I think Free League and Modifius and Cubico 7 and, uh, you know, Chaosium, they are cell phone companies, but they sort of produce products which have lines with modules and adventure and supplements. Uh, that's not what I identify with indie. And then even within indie, uh, you're entirely right. There are well games like my game, Paris Gondo, which are uh, 20, I think they're, they're nine pages long rules. Then you got one page RPGs. Then you got Mothership in a sort of zine format. And then you got the, the Nibiru and I, I assume Free Space, uh, which are uh, a bit more fleshed out. 300 some odd pages. Yeah. So there's a big difference between like page length and what it is. So story games, that's a pretty encapsulated thing. What is a story game? It can flip around a little bit, tweak and widen. And they've developed it, started developing new ideas on like, I would say the other side of the spectrum with things like even further like with lyric games and and then there's trad games but there's a bunch of stuff in between that that are not trad at all because they do these things that such games wouldn't do like they focus on things so i've kind of tried to been coining this term because i think there needs to be something that kind of coins that idea of i'm making a game specifically to do this and i'm developing all of the skills or attributes or whatever, all the stats and mechanics to do this. And this is what it does. And it doesn't have to be super narrow, but it has to be just kind of be about this. Yeah, I think something like, to, to be honest, focus games, I think it kind of matches what I'm starting to clearly more, to identify in a more clear fashion. You know, I've been exploring a lot of different games, playing with different communities since the the beginning of the lockdown because there's a lot of online gaming so you can try stuff and i've mm. grown very annoyed i mean i shouldn't be saying that but tomorrow i, I start a stream of mask of Nealatotep on the stream channel mm. so it's going to be a weekly show and i had to create a character in puk tulu for that uh the vc even uh, call of tulu and i was very frustrated because i was like this game actually doesn't do anything it gives you stats for skills, but it's not supporting the color, a specific experience. What What's the focus here? I think focus can be something like Blades in the Dark. It's focused on you play criminal and heist. It works great. Tonight, I'm running Brindlewood Bay and you play cozy TV format investigations. It does something specific and I'm, I'm very uh, that's what I want now from a game. I want it to say, okay, that's my thing and I do it well. And if you play me, you, you won't be bothering about doing Kung Fu moves. You can describe Kung Fu moves, but you don't have three different skill set to, to, to represent them. Yeah, it seems like, so like Call of Cthulhu, like COC, great game but it's very much a trad game it's it's of its time they've rebooted it tweaked it made it slimmer which is great makes it a lot easier to play but it's still very like okay you can kind of do anything we leave you kind of floating but we're technically about this and i would say that you know things like world of darkness games are the same thing like they say they're about this kind of storytelling system but they're not really they just have a general system that kind of does stuff like you're a vampire and we have some vampire mechanics but we also have mechanics to do non-vampire stuff all over the place. Well, if you play Trail of Cthulhu as a different thing, or, uh, that uh, that game is very, very, very much about mystery mechanics. Like they're all built into it. There's a whole investigation system. There's a spend system. So it's very difficult to do non-investigation stuff with any of the gumshoe games. Like, so for your your uh, your game you could use uh, like the yellow king role-playing game system instead of neuro instead of using uh, coc and you would have a very much more focused system but you wouldn't find it as straightforward or tight or single thing as like a story game which is like on the bottom so that's where it, i feel the difference between 
this stuff I'm talking about and calling focus games and a story game like Blades, which kind of just 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 on the top of story games, right? Oh, really? Focus games and story games would be because Blades basically forces you to tell almost a specific story, right? It's very, very structured and very, very narrow. But if you widen that out a little bit, you find things like Red Markets, My Game, Trail of Cthulhu, who are wider than that, but still focused on a specific type of gameplay. Now, I mean, you could have make a wider version perhaps of Blades, but one of the things that he, I, great game and the designer did some really amazing stuff with it, but he made it so you could swap out as a hacker to do different things rather than building that into the game itself. So if he would have written a game, it wasn't called Blades in the Dark, it was a more general forged in the dark game that had part of the rules as coming up with what type of heist you were doing, kind of broader faction, then he would probably flow more into what I would call a focus game. So that's, I really see the difference. Like a free spacer, I give you at the beginning, you come up with your setting and stuff. If I wanted to make it more like more of a narrow setting, I would have had a very specific setting and more of a specific story that you were telling. Like maybe I'd have like five parts and you'd move through. And this is the part where you found out the world was more this way or whatever. And all that would be built into the, into the more greater structure of the mechanics. And then it would turn into a story game. But because I kind of left that up to you as a group, and left it broader that way. Like you get to choose if you're a Merc, you get to choose what the names of these different societies are like, what your major themes are. It winds that out. It's a preference I, of how you want to design, but that's what I decided to do. And it kind of makes it a broader, less specific uh, experience uh, for everybody. So when you say your if game... You know I mean. Yeah, if, but if you when you say your games... Is 300 pages. Uh, is it 300 pages of adventures, of setting? Uh, it doesn't sound like it's the rules, or mm. is it? So what what sort of uh, the content you get when you get free spacer? Uh, a lot of people call it tool set. Uh, I've heard that actually saw one of the earlier uh, talks about what free spacer was, calling it a tool set, because I do stuff that kind of lends to that idea. So like the book has no setting in it, but it has a tools for creating your own setting. The book doesn't have a specific theme. It has ones that are built into the mechanics of the game. There's the whole free spacers are outsiders. They're greater than at the same time being less than than the people who are in the regular universe definitely less than, than the people who are really powerful and that sort of thing. They're kind of sent on these contracts that they kind of have to do because the experience points system is, is cargo in the game. And the only way, you, best way to gain cargo is by doing these contracts, which govern the whole game, which is partly a uh, mechanic for allowing the GM to know what in the universe to make, <laughs> which is a problem with space sci-fi. But it's also... Uh, kind of part of the theme, the base theme in the game of, you know, pushing you to see how far you're going to go for your patrons, what you'll do for experience points kind of idea. Uh, but the game has a lot of systems in it because I'm a bit of a systems wonk. I, I like to do systems design. So the game has systems to create your own aliens. It has systems to create worlds. It has systems to create all this sort of stuff. Uh, one of the things that I built, and almost half the book, is prepping the game. Uh, most games don't have a lot. They kind of let you figure it out for yourself. They're like, well, prepping is up to you, what you want to do. But I decided it would, I want to tell the GM how to, how to set up, how to prep the game. So the game, if you looked at the game resources, like PDF, it's got the ship sheet which is a two-sided sheet that has everything you need on it for the ship. It's got the crew sheets, which has everything on it you need for your individual crew member, two-sided as well. But it also has sheets for, for different types of NPCs. And it has what I would call like a setting book where you set up your initial setting for. 
And then as a GM, you come up with the setting stuff, some of it together, and the rest you do as a GM. So it has a Cold War phase, which is like one for managing the sandbox. It's got uh, how to create different impossible things. So when you want to, I set up certain things in the core rules to be something that doesn't exist, like teleporters and um, long distance, uh, Ansible, like faster than light communications and stuff. Uh, and I made these impossible so that when you as a GM introduce some of these things, they're extraordinary, like, like uh, sapient AI or that sort of thing. And then if you go through the game prep section, it has how to create the core, the world, settlements, species, factions, all of this stuff is all in there. It's got so it is quite like a systems thing. If you follow it through step by step, you, you'll make a whole game of this and then you can make everything you need. There's not like a ton of content in it. it does, it's not like a book of guns or anything like that. There's actually very few things about guns in the book, but it tells you how to make all your own drones. It tells you how to make shuttles and spacecraft, all the stuff you don't need to play. You know, that's a very interesting concept because I I mean, I remember game books or lines of games which had very interesting modules giving ad advice to game masters, but I don't remember... I mean, I know Traveler, I know games, like I, I'm a fan of something called the, the Mother of All Encounter Tables. You know, when you have a, a journey, you can roll on that uh, to find what sort of encounter you're going to run into. It's supposed to be done, I think, for D&D 2nd Edition, but... I was using it for Star Trek because well, why not if people are on the planet? But I I never I don't remember a module dedicated to prepping. And these are tools for prepping your game. You got a few random tables, you, but it's not only random table. It's a a flow chart of some kind, an instruction on how to balance things and how you you kick that imagination with a few constraints. Because I'm really into that setting myself constraint, randomizing a few elements to, to bring me inspiration. That's how I work. I, I, it's nothing worse than a blank page for me to start with and how you manage the evolution of the players and the, the sandbox. So all of that sounds very exciting, actually. And I, I it's really a pity that it's not more common. It, it, I noticed that and I was listening. I was listening to people complain about it and some people say stuff like, Oh well, you should tell the GM how to how to run the game. And I was like, nobody ever tells a GM how to run the game or how to prep for the game. Like, there's advice, but advice is not the same as here's how you run this specific game. That's a completely different thing, right? So I'm like, well, I'm gonna add that, and then it turned out to be like a massive part of the book because <laughs> it's really big. Like the GM in GM full games, which this is a GM full game, uh, has a lot of things they have to do. They have a lot of like lonely fun and they have a lot of uh, uh, just, just stuff they have to do that the players don't have to do, like different things. It's a truly, if role playing games in GM full games are very, what you would call a, asymmetrical mm -hmm. like the stuff that gm does the game master does is very different and from what the players do so like in free spacer the game prep section there's a section called game prep it's chapter five starts at page 223 and goes until like 330 <laughs> something like it's 100 pages out of the book so it's a full third of the book is done like this. And then there's a whole section on running the game, which is a separate section that takes up another, like, I don't know, 100 pages, I think. Yeah, 100, almost like 80 pages or something. So that's, that's the, and they're completely different sections. One is basically making content. Because I've never been one who likes making content for everybody, because I feel like you have to do it ad nauseum. Right? I mean... If you look at the venerable Dungeons and Dragons, they are very clever about this. They create content, leave holes, and then convince you 
you still think it's a good game and make you want to fill in the content yourself. And then you create content for it and it creates buy-in. I never thought of doing this, <laughs> but it's a brilliant idea that they did. And it's worked for however long RPGs have been around. But that's kind of the opposite of what I did. I just gave you systems to create everything and then systems to run everything. And yeah. the game is very systems driven in a lot of ways because it has like science projects, what I call them, where you can do your, you do your contract negotiation. It's how you do salvage. It's how you do investigation. It's even how you kind of manage, it's how you do travel. Travel's a big deal in the game. And it has a whole system called projects and they work for all of these things. Cause I like to start with like a single mechanical system which is the core game mechanic of how you roll dice and kind of expand that out and projects are the advanced mechanic rather than in say classic OSR or something where combat is in this it's just projects like salvage and investigation and fabrication and retirement and those sorts of things. So does that mean that you you generate adventures for free spacer or do you have adventure modules as well for the game that people can purchase? Well, there I have so what I've done is one of the things I realized is because the game is so uh focused on you building your own world. You literally build worlds, but you build your own setting from the start. So as the players and a GM sitting down to play in your session zero, you discuss what the game is about. And then you would start putting together, uh, you put together, it's like a top down kind of thing. So you put together three societies that are big, massive societies within these societies. So you decide who they are and what they are, and you decide how it dealt with the exploration wars. So exploration wars are one of the major elements of the core setting, like the core part of it. There was a war, The war has just ended, and now you're kind of the leftover tools of the war, the kind of disposable assets of it. And you spend, as the players and GMs, you, you come up with factions within these alien species that are part of these societies and members of these factions. I wanted to create a multicultural system. So you have no like Klingon empire or something like that. Like you'd have a Star Trek. It's not species driven. So every society has multiple species in it. You could be a human from all of them or any of them, depending on what you decide as a group is what you want to do. And then you move through all of that. And because of that is a little bit of a thing to do and people like examples and people want these, I created what I call the sector archives which is basically all that initial prep plus the prep for the first session and that map that you make of the sector that you're doing, that you're using, all that stuff set up for you. And it has one for every flag plus two because I decided to make one that was about pirates. And the pirate one is more about anti-establishment kind of a punk thing. I kind of took reference from a whole variety of fiction that deals with like earth being conquered by aliens kind of stuff oh like v and stuff so uh that one is really the main adventure for that is your free spacers that come in to help the organizers of a mass protest against the organization that basically runs the earth appointing a new governor so it's the social justice uh anti-establishment like pirate setting that i kind of did so if you play that particular setting in the sector archives which i think is one of the later ones in the book i'd have to get it out to look where i put it in the end but um you deal with this and it's it's a pretty open contract it's like it's one of the contracts so the way contracts work is you do negotiation on this and the gm does like a a pitch and then you fill that out and then you can add addendums so this one is all about adding addendums to the contract one of the contract terms is to basically take three up to at least three addendums And each addendum gets you paid more and that sort of thing. 
<laughs> and so you have addendums of picking up this guy somewhere like on Mars to bring him in illegally underneath the blockade so he can speak, running around making sure that, you know, protesters don't get attacked, all this sort of stuff that you can do and all these characters. Uh, because of the way I designed the game, it's a little bit difficult to create modules that are traditional modules because it's not unlike some like Dungeons and Dragons, which is the base unit in a in a D and D game is the encounter. The base unit in Free Spacer is characters and locations. They're not necessarily related. You don't say the characters are in locations necessarily, but you create basically a cast of characters. You make all these sheets for them. And then you create different locations that may or may not have maps, if you want, of different scales. And then uh, it's got parts that you can fill out on the characters and on the maps that say what they want and what they're doing. And the idea is supposed to be the ultimate sandbox is you could literally, if you wanted, take any character and put it in the location and it would work. It's a bit modular in that way. Yeah, that really makes reminds me of uh, well a couple of things uh, really. Uh, I really recommend the anime Iron Blooded Orphans, uh, Gundam, uh, because you had a... oh, it's a Gundam one. Okay. Yeah, but it, it's sort of I, I'm not a, a Gundam specialist at all. That's the only show I a Gundam show I watch. So it's sort of self-contained, and it's about a a group of workers on Mars who uncover a Gundam because those things are lying mm. around and they, they start becoming a crew, a mercenary group, and they got a contract to um, to escort someone to Earth and then they got addendums and they meet other organizations and they start being am amalgamated to them, but it's still very focused on the crew, so you definitely would have that. And, and otherwise, a, a book series which I, I love, uh, I give uh, my son uh, his middle name based on that, is the, the Miles Volker Sagan se series or the Volker Sagan saga. And in the first one, uh, Young Miles, it starts with the main character who uh, have some disabilities. Uh, he's trying to attend the, the military academy of his planet because he comes from a line of militaries and he, he fails at it and he decides to go into a freelancer in space and uh, work with stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit random. He finds a ship. Then he gets a crew together, and each time he sort of haggles his way. Uh, he's, he's like the ultimate face. Uh, he's like arguing his way all through his adventures, a bit like uh, also Kurgle uh, in a fantasy setting. But it's it's really excellent. It's all about also contracts and developing things and uh, and and becoming uh, the head of a, a group of uh, of mercenaries uh, in, in that case. So yeah, I think the the Volker Sagan universe sounds like a similar genre. Yeah, yeah, because it's sort of, uh, it's I I don't yeah there are a few species which are not exactly humans. They are modified humans. Um, like you got quaddies who got uh, arms instead of legs because they were genetically designed. Uh, the base is still human, but they were designed to work in zero gravity environment. And then they, they found out about artificial gravity, so they were useless. But uh, it's all about different cultures. The idea is that humanity spread out through space and then different cultures and different empires or republic or whatever, uh, conglomerates uh, develop their, their own culture. So so <clears throat> free space would be uh, maybe the system I was looking for to, to run adventures in that world. Because there's a lot of blanks, so you could still use the you know, the framework of it and still fill uh, everything which is going on uh, in between. So that sounds like... Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say with the, the humans only thing, uh, there's actually one of the settings in it, Insect Archives has that. I think it's the one Johnstone Metzger made where he basically made all the different species uh, genetically modified humans. Okay. So, well, it's so sort you of... could totally do a thing where you have humans have kind of divided into different species. I guess it's like sort of the, totally the theories you see sometimes. I, I think it's Star Trek. That's one of the explanations also that it's not that humans colonized the, the universe is that they had cedars, a civilization long gone who spread around. I guess it's a bit like Prometheus also humans across the world mm -hmm. and they, they evolve into Bajorans, Klingons and Vulcans, although they 
they are quite different. They still have the the same starting point, which is the reason why they can all be played by humans with a, a tiny bit of makeup. Yeah, I, I saw that episode. That was a really interesting uh, episode entirely based to kind of show why they have that focus. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> kind I, love, of silly. I love when they, they retrofit things to, to explain, oh yeah, that's the reason why. Or like in Enterprise, when they explain why the Klingons didn't have the ridges in uh, the original series and uh, and this sort of things. Uh, but uh, uh, Free Spacer is set in the, the future, but what is the future for, for Free Spacer at the moment? Do we have uh, more stuff planned? Uh... Well, right now, Free Spacer, this happens with, a, I think, a lot of smaller games. Uh, I decided to make Free Spacer as a pretty, pretty much an enclosed space. I didn't want to try to as a one ship fleet here that I am all by myself, I didn't really want to try to manage an entire line of games uh, and build a system. Like that's why the game is one of the reasons the game is more system driven than it is content driven. Cause mm -hmm. if you content drive, you have to help more content come out in the future, which is really great if you're trying to run a whole series of games and you have the resources for that and you build a company to do that. But I didn't, think this project would have that and it doesn't it's I, i'm not going to be moving up it's not making profits enough for me to hire anybody uh so what instead is it's a focused experience and it's a, just a basic like it's the book and it has a side book to help you figure out how to create your own settings and that sort of thing and it's running right now on a long tail on the business side so strangely enough january was probably the best month i've had since uh july oh, on congratulations RPG for yeah it's crazy i have no idea why this month is great like december was terrible like super bad on drive through but january turned out to be amazing so it's it's kind of funky that way but it's it's still going and i'm just trying to support it i have i'm online all over the place i even have a little tiny kind of private discord that anybody who's really interested in the game can join and i just had new people like contact me like just yesterday asking to join and it's a pretty small little thing it's i'm not trying to make it a giant community it's basically like a support area where you can kind of come be like, hey, I want to talk about free spacer or whatever. Yeah, I'm here. I've got a place. Uh, and, but I'm also on Twitter and I'm also on Facebook and all that sort of stuff. And the idea is just to bring it along. Uh, currently, I'm working on a different project that uses the same but slightly modified base mechanics and some of the same ideas but kind of flipped on their head to do something different. Because the systems and mechanics for free, free spacer were really sci-fi driven like instead of having attributes as your base you have a set of like 15 skills that are very specific to that kind of genre and you have a starship as a separate sheet and all of this stuff and all the projects they play like science right that's how you do your crazy gobbledygook star trek stuff you can fabricate devices and things if you wish. Uh, you can make stuff. But so all of that stuff is so science fiction that I've been looking at it. Oh, what else can I do with this? And I've been moving into something else to do with that. So Free Spacer itself isn't over. I'm supporting it like forever. And maybe something will happen or maybe... I'm enough of my understanding will change that I'll think about doing a second edition someday in the long distance future. But for now, it's about keeping that together and slowly building up its its audience, like the people who know about it and want to play it and building that community. So did you have uh, any any surprising or especially exciting uh tales from the community about them playing your game and coming up with stuff you, you didn't expect or did that you did expect in terms of developing a world and, uh, and adventures? Uh, I'm delighted every time I hear people are playing the game and they send me stuff. Like if you go on Twitch, 
you know, Twitter or on like on Facebook or any social medias and send me links and pictures to your gameplay, I'll be like super happy to watch or listen or just look at your cool pictures. Um, I just had a group start playing mildly recently and basically I'm pretty sure they play on the weekend because every weekend I get <laughs> a little picture on Twitter and I'm like, oh cool, they're doing this and that and I hear about what they're doing and what, what sort of crews they're playing. And that sort of thing, because the game is divided into flags, which basically represent the kind of gameplay you're expecting. So you play, if you're going to play a mercenary, you choose the mercenary flag, that sort of thing. Uh, this group's playing technicians, which is uh, kind of shadow runny, kind of uh, tech fixer, tech expert kind of in space. It's probably the least well represented in current science fiction kind of group. So it's it's really interesting to see as they play and nobody ever does anything exactly how I expect it. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, interesting. And it, it's always interesting what rules they get right away and what they're like, Oh, I'm having such a hard time with this. It's like, did you do the sandbox cold war phase stuff? And they're like, no. Well, if you do that, like it says, then you'll be easy to come up with contracts. So like, Oh, that's what that's for. And so they go and do that. And then they, I never hear back because I guess it went well. But <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's kind of that funny sort of thing uh, where you hear bits and pieces and you seldom get big, long stories. I'm actually looking forward to the return of like in-person conventions because I'm hoping people will come up to me and just tell me about their Free Spacer game for however long they can spare. Because I didn't want to hear about it. Did you have time to to do a few conventions before Hell Break Loose? Uh, was Free Spacer already well, out? Well, Free Spacer was under development for a really long time. I did it as a side project while I was in the video game industry for most of its existence. So I was taking it to small conventions and a lot of like the play testing and early early chats with people and stuff were at like a local convention across the border in Seattle or we actually have one here. Uh, it's not dedicated to just role-playing games. It's called TCTC. And the actual TCTC 2021 is gonna be online. It's coming up uh, in March and we're gonna be running uh, a, like a online RPG room. And I'm actually running Free Spacer on the stream that they're running. So you can look at Terminal City Tabletop Convention um, and you can check all that out, but it's, it's always great to see that stuff, but I took a uh, free spacer to all sorts of little conventions all over the place. I even took it to one in Indianapolis one time and like fear of the con that was early days. The game was very different back then, but I took it to at least two gen cons plus one, right. As it was about to come out. So it's been around for a while. Seen lots of people have to roll a big handful of two different opposing dice in a lot of different convention settings. And one of the things that definitely taught me was how different it is running convention games to running the game for uh, a campaign. Mm -hmm. You really have to do some heavy lifting as a GM, which is one of the reasons the Sector Archives is so, is so great. I use it all the time to run convention games because it's like stuff set up and it's got characters and all that stuff. I don't have to run through all that cool customization with players because you just don't have time for that. So I have to do that by myself. So it's, you know, like you're going to run this for four hours and then probably never ever think about it again. You don't want to create a whole thing, a custom setting for a group every time. So that's the sector archives is really good for that. I use one of those every single time. So. It's quite interesting uh, as an experience I find also. I did a bit of that even before developing my game, running the same. I'm a lazy game master. Uh, I, I love game mastering, but it really takes me in a special place for to start to really do. Uh, it's, it's weird. On one hand, it's hard for me to do prep lately. But on the other hand, that's how I like game mastering. 
So this, I like my games to be prepped. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean I'm railroady, but I know where stuff are and I'm more reactive to what the players come up with because I know where stuff are lying around in, in my world. I know my toolbox. So my the way I compromise is by starting to run the same adventures, the same story several times for different people. So this is where I got comfortable mm -hmm. with it. And then now playtesting, that's a very interesting experience to run the same thing over and over again and see all things change each time. And also you get better at it because, yeah, you, you're used to, to, to things. Huh? Yeah, I mean, that becomes a thing. I also realize how different people are in what they, how they will do something. So one of the standard... Uh, sets it's the first one uh, in, in the sector archives. I've run it a lot at cons and everybody's different. Most people don't finish it. It's totally finishable. I had a group finish it in three hours. They just went, they went, they like threaded the needle, went through everything, finished the entire like scenario in three hours, super fast. We were done half an hour early. They only took half an hour to do setup. I was like, wow, this group was focused. <laughs> Most groups make it to like stage two. There's a couple different kind of stages that I kind of feel the game goes into. Like it's very free spacer. So it's like, here's a place. Here's a place within the place. You're looking for the second place within the place. How do you do that? And you can do it any way you want. But there's kind of stages like do you get to the first place do you, do you deal with the center part do you spend a bunch of time on the space station uh lots of times i close the space station just because i don't want people to spend all their time on the space station i'd rather they spend their time doing other things so it's kind of like that you see how these different groups do it and what sort of things they get obsessed over and you find that as a GM, when I mention this thing, they might get obsessed over. If I don't mention it, they go in a completely different direction, that sort of thing. And how one of the things that's always difficult with science fiction is uh, narrowing down what people's understanding of like technology is, because yeah. technology is such a powerful force in science fiction. Like, Free Spacer doesn't have Ansible. It has Ansible within system, but not outside. Ansible is like faster than light communications. You can't contact another system directly. Instead, a ship basically loads the entire internet into everybody on board's personal area networks because ships don't have their own comm systems. Each person does. Well, civilian ships and stuff do, but free spacers have their own comms, so the ship doesn't need it, so they can protect the ship's internal like network by behind their own system. So you have to hack a person to get to their ship. Anyways, all of that sort of understanding of that, the fact that uh, life support is a biotech system, basically your ship breathes, it's got like a biome built into it, almost like a creature. That sort of stuff takes a bit of time to teach in a con session that is actually a measurable amount of time. You know, a campaign is like, okay, first session, second session, third session, everybody's got it down, all the little mistaken ideas and weirdness that everybody can be an engineer. You can't just be the specialty engineer because there's so many types of engineering. <laughs> but that's so all that sort of understanding you kind of shed off in a couple sessions in the regular game but at a con i have to try to communicate that in like 20 minutes so that we can get to playing that is always something too so you notice that sort of thing is it's it's quite interesting compared to fantasy where it's like high or low low there's not a lot of magic okay got it go you know it's like what culture are we pretending to be done so it's a lot more work that way. Yeah, and also science fiction. I, I had a bit, a, a bit of a bad surprise when I went back at uh, game mastering Star Wars because my approach to it was really okay. Star Wars D6. That's where I started. I know the system and it's simple. Star Wars. Everybody knows Star Wars, so I'm gonna show up. 
put my feet under the table and see what happens. Simple story. You start in the, the tattooing cantina. And then I realized, hold on a minute. Since I last played, they released the prequels and the sequels. And our technology and our use of technology has changed, you know, because a couple decades passed. So suddenly you have players say, okay, I'm going to take the ship and use it like a satel observation satellite and take satellite view. And you're like, uh, no, you cannot, you cannot do that with a transport ship. Okay, I go to the register and I connect to their database and start using the equivalent of the internet. And you're like, no, actually you cannot do that in Star Wars. And, and then suddenly you realize, oh, oh God, I need to come up with a clear explanation of what is going on here. And for Star Wars, the explanation is, okay, it's World War I slash World War II in space. Uh, but you got shit <laughs> binoculars, you got shit radar, uh, your, your computer technology is very, very limited. Uh, but, but, but that's it. And uh, a lot of, s more and more of our science fiction, the, you know, the big popular references are actually retro futuristic, not really futuristic anymore. And if we were trying to do futuristic stuff, I think we're not quite there yet. I think it's, it's kind of a, I, I'm not familiar with novels what is going on in science fiction right now, but it really feels like anticipation. We are sort of caught in changes too much in real life to start really right anticipation, you know, popular stories, which are proper anticipation, really understanding what is going on with the, with the internet, with social media, with what everything we, we are we coming up with. So you're entirely right. When it's science fiction, it's actually, okay, what type of science fiction? What can I do? And each element, information, transport, weaponry, all this stuff, you need to make decisions on where you're going. Yeah, so Free Spacer specifically, and it's always been kind of the goal, was to be contemporary science fiction. You literally carry the internet with you all, all times. We call it the data flow because you got to change the name of science fiction, right? Uh, but I called it the data flow. You have unlimited storage. So you copy a clone of the entire internet, the entire data flow. So you, if you can find it with a good research role, can find out anything that is vaguely public. Okay private things aren't put on the data flow because that's how it works. Nobody puts their private database on the data flow. They keep it hidden in another one and don't sync it. So I don't know if you know much about software development or whatever, but basically the internet is also three-dimensional because you can look at when things are changed. So you have a time element to the data flow in Free Spacer. So not only can you see that something exists. You could see that something used to exist and then it was erased. You could also see when it was erased and all this sort of thing, which can make an investigation in free space are really interesting. You can see that, oh, this government took over and then they did this stuff and then they were overthrown and they did this stuff and they changed history this way, but people didn't believe it because they could still research back in time. <laughs> Like that's all a thing because it's contemporary science fiction. The internet's there. Uh, PC hive mind, that's a thing because we have brain control interface, which is basically your sci-fi scanners scan your brain waves, know what you want the technology to do and you can just do it, which means I can tell my comms to send you a message at any time and you can calm me back. So does that mean- In real time and I can just hear it. So does that mean in terms of information? Because that's the thing uh, uh, I used to do when I was running Star Trek, uh, a little campaign in Starfleet Academy. The idea was, well, mm -hmm. all the information is there, but how do you ask for it? It's yeah, about how do you phrase your request to the computer? Because if you just say, oh, what's this thing? And the computer is like, I don't know, it's... It's too vague. So, okay. So please computer cross-reference the, that word in the history in relationship to, uh, murders, which would have taken place. Okay. Red Jack. Okay. It turns out that this is an extract from a letter by Jack the Ripper, uh, alleged crimes, a uh, 19th century earth, 21st century Mars. And your players are like, what? But, but it's about how they phrase that. Yeah, it's less of a gotcha than that, but essentially you have access to everything. You just have to find it. 
And so you spend your time, you can do a research role, which is, uh, is actually a culture skill. It's in the uh, interface skill, uh, one of the specialties, there's specialties within skills in FreeSpacer. So you do a culture, culture is a, a, a group of skills that are all about social stuff. And interface is the main computer, like internet kind of stuff. So there's communications, research, that sort of stuff in there. And so you would probably do a role within that looking for something specific. If you don't find it, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you couldn't find it. It was hidden. It was buried in data. And then if you want to hack something, that's actually an engineering skill in, in that section in what's called inscription because the technology is virtual. Almost all the technology in Free Spacer that does like sci-fi stuff like shields and everything is virtual. It's literally drawing circuits and programs on the space time itself. And it doesn't dissipate away quantum physics wise, this uh, folds in space time that you're controlling because you have an anchor. So you're your multi-tool, which acts as both a gun and a tractor beam and all sorts of stuff, or your link, which acts almost like a computer, is actually a series of hyperdiamond uh, devices that are basically anchors for this technology that's virtual in space-time. And I, I, the idea was like, how can you fold space? And how could it make it so you could hack things and everybody would have this stuff. And so I kind of came up with this space-time technology called a uh, zero point technology. Cool. And that's what the system's based. That's the hardcore hard sci-fi thing. And so you've got that and biotech. And so you don't climb through air ducts in free spacer, maybe on a space station, but probably not. You climb inside the wall and around you are something between a vine and a human-like circulatory system. <laughs> so it could get a little gross if you go inside it. It could be a really good place to hide because the other thing that doesn't exist in this world is life support system or life, life signs. Life signs is one of the weirdest Star Trek things ever. What is a life sign? I have no idea. I have no idea how they detect what a life sign is. In I Star guess heat, Star Trek. heat signature, heartbeats, uh, uh, emission of uh, respiratory gas. I guess <laughs> it doesn't. But it's it's very wishy washy. It's one of the Star Trek magic things. It's one of the reasons that you're like, okay, it's still sci fi, but this is totally like a it's just life signs and it's like this weird combination of stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense that they can detect further away than other things that should be higher energy so all of the sensors in free space are work by detecting how space time is folded around it so you can detect a person walking through because you can literally see their shape in three oh, dimensions wow. you can detect heat because energy actually moves space-time as well. So matter and energy all cause disruptions in space-time. That's how it works in real life, that's science. And so that's how all the sensors in free space are work. It's your spanning for that, but that, it means it's incredibly complex. And in some ways you could, like it's three-dimensional, but in some ways it's almost like four-dimensional because it'd be a difference in how energy and matter disrupt things. There's also, the zero point technology itself artificially does this. So you'd be able to detect if someone has a pan on them or not, like a personal area network, because you could detect this artificial expansion of space time around them because it's not increasing gravity, but it's causing this stuff. And so you could detect that. So that's how the sensors work. So there's no such thing as life science. If you want to do biosciences, there's no like, I'm going to cure you from orbit medicine in free spacer because that makes no sense and every time you're like oh i'm scanning your life signs from orbit and telling the guy how to fix you it's like what how like why is he not dying from cancer what are you doing <laughs> so instead it's biotech you're gonna go take a sample that gets you off your ship 
If you're a doctor, you got to get off the ship, take a sample, put it in what I call the biochem kit, which is part of your crew kit. So instead of the game having like endless series of guns or anything, it's got more of the Star Trek thing where you have like a small group of gear. And the reason you can have this is it's super flexible. It's part of the upgrade system and character creation and all that sort of thing. And so biochem kit is a device, it includes like every device has a set of mods on it. And that's where you spend the game's charge economy to get extra dice. So your incubators on your biochem kit is your thing for making stuff. So it's basically a cross between like a med kit, which it has a med tool in it, a 3D printer, because it has an incubator where you can grow things if you want to make a bomb, which players always want to do. I don't know why. <laughs> Anyways, you could literally grow organic C4 and then use someone else could engineer like a communication system for that and you could build a bomb that you could set off using your link at any time by putting these together and that's how like a fabrication project would work to reference back to what I talked about before but that's kind of the, the technologies all kind of work like that together and it kind of builds a very contemporary science fiction setting which is weird, as you said, because you don't see it very much. Even cyberpunk is retro because they always yeah. embrace the uh, noir element of cyberpunk so hard that you get kind of this noir feel of detective offices and stuff, right? It's nice. It's It sounds a bit like some things are... Uh... People can uh, mark on their bingo card uh, about the role list... Uh... <laughs> Because I'm an architect, and uh, you know, when I see science fiction, one of the the first thing I can look at, and immediately I'm turned on or turned off, is does the architecture look actually futuristic, or is it just Blade Runner again? Is it just tall skyscrapers, which is not where we're going in terms of lifestyle? Biotech would sound more like exciting stuff. I, I recommend people to go check if people are curious. Um, they could go check uh, the Amager plant. Uh, it's in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and it's a uh, it's a waste treatment facility, which is also a ski slope, and it's got the the elevation covered uh, with plant. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, an exa exciting one. Uh, but on that, uh, we passed the one hour mark, and uh, I got a dentist who tr is trying to call me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's there's actually an architecture skill or a specialty in Free Spacer, by the way. Of you course, should they should always like be, it. and you can solve everything <laughs> with that because an architect obviously knows and does everything. <laughs> hey, if you want to know the layout of a start of a of a space station by looking at it, roll your architecture specialty. But don't get me started about so-called IT architects. <laughs> I really dislike those people, especially when I'm looking for a job. <laughs> on that <laughs> christoph yeah. where can people uh find you when you wish to be found well the easiest thing really is to just go to my twitter which is zofra which is x-o-p-h-r-a uh on on twitter i'm also on uh, facebook you can find me pretty much the same way uh, or you can go to freespacer.com which has it is basically a hub for all of that stuff you can find where to buy the books. You can find my Twitter. You can find my Facebook and all that jazz there pretty easily. I will include links uh, in the description of the episode. So it's even easier for people uh, to find them. And this way I got views on my website also, which is great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Christoph. Uh, best uh, wishes of success uh, for the, the long tail of... Uh, free spacer and please do come back to tell us about your next project which we, we did not discuss today but uh, that leaves more well it, it's, it's not really ready yet so it's underway it's going good but i have to make some major decisions about it before i can really tell anybody about it so well uh you know where to find me once you you made that uh, that decision uh thanks everyone Excellent. for watching uh please remember to follow us on twitch uh, to subscribe on YouTube, leave a like to the video, a comment on the video, uh, to which I, I will be happy to reply, and I will let Christoph know uh, if there's any comments about Free Spacer 
on the video and uh, yeah do all these things and uh, we've got a patreon of course uh, now we got a coffee so if you like uh, coffee to support people financially and you like what we do please consider doing so uh, I yeah well I'm we are uh, uh, removing uh, money each month from our savings <laughs> with Persephilia, so uh, until I'm employed again, I would very welcome any sort of support to keep the lights on and the broadband flowing uh, and keep on flying like uh, the crew of a free spacer uh, uh, would. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks, Christoph. Bye. Thank you.